Bleak House by Charles Dickens, Chapter 56, Pursuit. Impassive as behooves its high breeding, the deadlock townhouse stares at the other houses in the street of dismal grandeur and gives no outward sign of anything going wrong within. Carriages rattle, doors are battered at, the world exchanges calls. The deadlock townhouse changes not externally, and hours pass before its exalted dullness is disturbed within. But Volumina the Fair, being subject to the prevalent complaint of boredom and finding that disorder attacking her spirits with some virulence, ventures at length to repair to the library for change of scene. Her gentle tapping of the door, producing no response, she opens it and peeps in. The sprightly deadlock is reputed in that grass-grown city of ancients. Bath, to be stimulated by an urgent curiosity, Certain it is that she avails herself of the present opportunity of hovering over her kinsman's letters and papers, hopping about from table to table with her glass at her eye. In the course of these researches, she stumbles over something and turning her glass in that direction, sees her kinsman lying on the ground like a felled tree. Volumina's pet little scream acquires a considerable augmentation of reality from this surprise, and the house is quickly in commotion. Servants tear up and down the stairs, bells are violently rung, doctors are sent for, and Lady Deadlock is sought in all directions but not found. Nobody has seen or heard her since she last rang her bell. Her letter to Sir Leicester is discovered on her table, but it is doubtful yet whether he has not received another missive from another world requiring to be personally answered. They lay him down upon his bed and chafe and rub and fan and put ice on his head and try every measure of restoration. Howbeit the day has ebbed away, and it is night before his strenuous breathing lulls, or his fixed eyes show any consciousness of the candle that is occasionally passed before them. But when this change begins, it goes on, and by and by he nods, or moves his eyes, or even his hand in token that he hears and comprehends. He fell down this morning, a handsome, stately gentleman, somewhat infirm, but of fine presence and with a well fitted and with a well filled face. He lies upon his bed, an aged man, with sunken cheeks, the decrepit shadow of himself. His voice was rich and mellow, and he has so long been, a th been thoroughly persuaded of the weight and import of mankind, of any word he said, that his words really had come to sound, as if there were something in them. But now he can only whisper, and what he whispers sounds like what it is, mere jumble and jargon. His favorite and faithful housekeeper stands at his bedside. It is the first act he notices, and he clearly derives pleasure from it. After vainly trying to make himself understood in speech, he makes signs for a pencil. It is his old housekeeper who makes out what he wants and brings in, in a slate. After pausing for some time, he, scrolly swal he slowly scrawls upon it in a hand that is not his. Chesney Wold? No, she tells him, he is in London. He has taken ill in the library this morning. Right, thankfully, she is that it happened to come, that she happened to come to London and is able to attend to him. It is not an illness of any serious consequence, Sir Leicester. You will be much better tomorrow, Sir Leicester. All the gentlemen say so. This, with tears coursing down her fair old face, after making a survey of the room and looking with particular attention all round. The bed where the doctors stand, he writes, My lady. My lady went out, said Leicester, before you were taken ill. And don't know if your illness yet, he points again in great agitation at the two words. They all try to quiet him, but he points again with increased agitation. On their looking at one another, not knowing what to say, he takes the slate once more and writes, My lady, for God's sake, where? And makes an imploring moan. It is thought better that his old housekeeper should give him Lady Deadlock's letter, the contents of which no one knows or can surmise. She opens it for him and puts it out for his perusal. Having read it twice, by great effort, he turns down so that it shall not be he turns it down so that it shall not be seen. And lies moaning. He passes into a kind of relapse, or into a swoon, and it is an hour before he opens his eyes, reclining on his faithful and attached old servant's arm. The doctors know that he is best with her and stand aloof. The slate comes into requisition again, but the word he wants to write he cannot remember. His anxiety, his eagerness, and affliction at this pass are, are pitiable to behold. 
It seems as if he must go mad in the necessity he feels for haste and the inability under which he labors of expressing to do what or fetch whom. He has written the letter B and there stopped. Of a sudden, in the height of his misery, he puts Mr. before it. The old housekeeper suggests, Bucket! Thank heavens, that is his meaning. Mr. Bucket is found to be downstairs by appointment. Shall he come up? There is no possibility of misconstruing Mr. Leicester's burning wish to see him, or the desire he signifies to have the room cleared of everyone but the housekeeper. It is speedily done, and Mr. Bucket appears. Of all men upon earth, Sir Leicester seems to place his sole trust and reliance upon this man. Sir Leicester Deadlock, Baronet, I'm sorry to see you like this. I hope you'll cheer up. I'm sure you will on account of the family credit. Sir Leicester puts her letter in his hands and looks intently in his face where, where he reads it. A new intelligence comes into Mr. Bucket's eye as he reads on. With one hook of his finger, he indicates, Sir Leicester Deadlock, Baronet, I understand you. Sir Leicester writes upon the slate. Full forgiveness. Fine. Mr. Bucket stops his hand. Sir Leicester Deadlock, Baronet, I'll find her, but my search after her must be begun out of hand. Not a minute must be lost. With the quickness of thought, he follows Sir Leicester Deadlock's look toward a little box upon, upon a table. Bring it here, Sir Leicester Deadlock, Baronet? Certainly. Open it with one of these here keys? Certainly. The littlest key? To be sure. Take the notes out? So I will. Count them? That's soon done. Twenty, and thirty's fifty, and twenty's seventy, and fifty's one twenty, and forty's one sixty. Take them for expenses? That'll do. And render an account? Of course. Don't spare money? No, I won't. The velocity and certainty of Mr. Bucket's interpretation on all these heads is a little short of miraculous. Mrs. Rouncewell, who holds the light, is giddy with the swiftness of eyes and hands as he starts up furnished for his journey. You're George's mother, old lady. That's about what you are, I believe, says Mr. Bucket, aside and buttoning his coat. Yes, sir, I am his distressed mother. So I thought, according to what he mentioned to me just now. Well, then, I'll tell you something. You needn't be distressed no more. Your son's all right. Now, don't you begin a crying because you've got, because what you've got to do is take care of Sir Leicester Deadlock Baronet. You won't do that by crying. As to your son, he's all right, I tell you. And he sends his loving duty and hoping you're the same. He's discharged honourable. And that's about what he is, with no imputation on his character. You may trust me, for I took your son. He conducted himself in a game way, too, on that occasion. So I trust a deadlock, Baronet. What you've trusted to me, I'll go through with. Don't be afraid of my turning out of, of my way, right or left, or taking a sleep, or wash, or a shave, till I have found what I go in search of. Say everything is kind and forgiving on your part, Sir Leicester Deadlock Baronet, I will, and I wish you better. And these family affairs smoothed over, as Lord, many other family affairs equally have been, and equally will be to the end of time. With this peroration, Mr. Bucket, buttoned up, goes quietly out, looking steadily before him, as if he were already piercing the night in quest of the fugitive. His first step is to take himself to Lady Deadlock's room and look all over them for any trifling indication that may help him. The rooms are in darkness now, and to see Mr. Bucket with a wax light in his hand, taking a sharp mental inventory of the many delicate objects so curiously at variance with himself, would be to see a slight which nobody does see, as he is particular to lock himself in. Even looking about, he has opened a dainty little chest in an inner drawer, his great hand turning over some gloves which it can scarcely feel. They are so light and soft within it, comes upon a white handkerchief. Hmm, let's have a look at you, says Mr. Bucket, putting down the light. What should you be kept yourself by yourself for? What's your motive? Are you her ladyship's property or somebody else's? You've got a mark upon you, I suppose. He finds it as he speaks. Esther Summerson. Oh, says Mr. Bucket, 
pausing with his finger in his ear. Come, I'll take you. He completes his observation as quietly and carefully as he has carried them on, leaves everything else precisely as he found it, glides away after some five minutes in all, and passes into the street. He sets off full swing to the nearest coach line, to the nearest coach stand, picks out the horse for his money, and directs to be driven to the shooting gallery. He dashes to his destination at such a speed that when he stops, the horse half smothers him in a cloud of steam. He runs up the long wooden entry and finds the trooper smoking his pipe. My lad, I haven't a word to spare. Now honor all save a woman, Miss Summerson, that was here when Gridley died. That was the name I know all right. Where does she live? The trooper has just come from there and gives him the address. You won't repent it, George. Good night. He is off again and gallops away again. Mr. Jarndyce, the only person up in the house, is just going to bed, rises from his book, and hearing the rapid ringing of the bell, on hearing the rapid ringing of the bell, and comes down to the door in his dressing gown. Don't be alarmed, sir. I've had the pleasure of seeing you before, Inspector Bucket. Look at this handkerchief, sir. Miss Esther Summerson's. Found it myself, put away in a drawer of Lady Dedlock's quarter of an hour ago. Not a moment to lose, matter of life or death. There has been a discovery today. Family affairs have come out. Sir Leicester Dedlock, baronet, has had a fit, apoplexy or paralysis, and couldn't be brought to, and precious time has been lost. Lady Dedlock disappeared this afternoon and left a letter for him that looks bad. Run your eye over here. Uh, run your eye over it. Here it is, Mr. Jarndyce, having read it, asks him what he thinks. I don't know. It looks like suicide. Anyways, there's more and more danger every minute of its drawing to that. I'd give a hundred pound an hour to have got the start of the present time. Now, Mr. Jarndyce, I have, am employed by Sir Leicester Deadlock Baronet to follow her and find her to save her and take her for her his forgiveness. I have money and full power, but I want something else. I want Miss Summerson. Now, Mr. Jarndyce... Mr. Bucket has read his face with the greatest attention all along. I speak to you as a gentleman of a humane heart, and under such pressing circumstances as don't often happen. If ever delay was dangerous, it's dangerous now. And if ever you couldn't have afterwards forgive yourself for causing it, it's this time. Eight or ten hours worth, as I tell you, a hundred pounds apiece at least, have been lost since Lady Dedlock disappeared. I am charged to find her. I am Inspector Bucket. Besides, all the rest, that's heavy on her. She has upon her, as she believes, suspicion of murder. If I follow her alone, she being in ignorance of what Sir Leicester Dedlock Baronet has communicated to me, may be driven into desperation. But if I follow her in company with a young lady... She has a tenderness for, she will give me credit for being friendly. Let me be able to put that young lady forward, and I'll save her and prevail with her. If she is alive, let me come up with her alone. A hard matter, and I'll do my best. But I don't answer for what the best time for what the best may be. Time flies. It's getting on for one o'clock. When one strikes, there's another hour gone, and it's worth a thousand pounds now instead of a hundred. This is all true, and the pressing nature of the case cannot be questioned. Mr. Jarndyce begs him to remain there while he speaks to Miss Summerson. Mr. Bucket says he will, but acting on his usual principle, does no such thing. Following upstairs instead and keeping his man in sight, in a very little time, Mr. Jarndyce comes down and tells him that Miss Summerson will join him directly to accompany him where he pleases. Mr. Bucket, satisfied, expresses high approval and awaits her coming at the door. Where is she? Living or dead, where is she? If, as he folds the handkerchief and carefully puts it away, it were able, with an enchanted power, to bring before him the place where she found it, and the night land and the night landscape near the cottage where it covered the little child, would he descry her there? And that is the end of chapter fifty six.